at this time, I have a, a little special gift from our church. Uh, it's a video. Palm Bay would like to give a heartfelt welcome to the wife of Dr. Baker. Dr. Susan Baker has a multitude of academic achievements in public health and physical therapy. She currently practices geriatric and physical therapy in suburban Maryland. But most importantly, Palm Bay, today, April 22nd, she is celebrating her birthday. Let's wish her a blessed and beautiful Sabbath birthday. Happy birthday, Dr. Susan Baker. Amen. <laughs> All right, Sister Dr. Adams, will you come at this time? We have a little presentation. And this is our way of saying happy birthday to Sister Baker. Amen? Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. What a good God. That's yes, Sister Adams. Praise the Lord, church family. It's an honor and a privilege to stand here today, and I'm so happy to see Dr. Delbert Baker in the house. Amen? Dr. Baker, I remembered when we heard that you accepted the call to go to Africa. Our women's prayer team went into prayer for you because we know you were going across the continent and a new church home, a new um, academic setting. And we were, well, we know that you're a good, the step of a good man. It's ordered by the Lord. And so we prayed for weeks and months. And now look at God has done great things for you. You look wonderful. So I know God has blessed you as you went to serve you and your beautiful wife. How awesome is that? Praise the Lord, and you would come back to us at Palm Bay. Amen. Dr. Phipps, now we're ready for Dr. Susan. <laughs> yes. On behalf of our church, as we said again, thank you. Thank the Lord for you and may you enjoy this token. Amen. Thank you. Thank and you also, so much. And I hold it for you. Thank you. And you can say a few words to the church if you'd like. Oh, I don't know what to say. What do you say on a birthday after you get past a certain number of birthdays? <laughs> You're a little cautious. But thank you so much to our friends, Wentley and Linda. We have known them, let's not say how many years, but, <laughs> but we thank you. I am so thankful to the Lord for another birthday, and I'm thankful to my dear husband, who I love so much. Um, we come to Palm, we're members here. You don't know this, but we're members in a church in Maryland, but we often come here to worship with you after we go to church in Maryland. So we really feel like Palm Bay members, but thank you so much. Linda, we love you. Wintley, we love you. Thank you. God bless you. Please welcome Sister Nahomi Noseworthy. Flows to the lowest 
this praise team without any compensation just because of their love for God and their desire to serve they bless us every Sabbath and I'm going to do something I don't think I've ever seen a pastor do I want to hug every one of them say thank you God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you. I'm going to hang on to this one a little longer. God bless you. Thank you. You were beautiful. Beautiful job this morning. God bless you. And I, I'm going to go crazy. I'm going to give Brother SL a hug too. How about that? Amen. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Let the church say amen. Amen. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you. Amen. It's my, my privilege and my honor to introduce and to present to my church family this morning. You feel the love in this church? That's Palm Bay. You're feeling Palm Bay today. And we are honored to extend that love to the speaker of the hour, Dr. Delbert Baker. A Seventh-day Adventist minister, pastor, author, educator, administrator, man I have known and have been privileged to call a friend for more than 50 years. It's hard to have people in your life that you still call friend after 50 years. Dr. Baker was a very successful pastor, but while we were students together teenagers at Oakwood University way back in the 70s. I mean like way back. I remember my wife who was my girlfriend then still is. Thank you Jesus. Uh, she, ma she made a prophecy. She, she said I prophesied that Delbert Baker is going to one day become president of Oakwood University, which he became and served admirably as the 10th president of Oakwood University and took it from a college to a university. And I was honored and blessed when he allowed me to be the first recipient of an honorary doctorate from Oakwood University. He served as the vice president of the General Conference. He served as president of the Adventist University of Africa, transforming that institution forever. It'll never be the same. And he currently serves as Director of Research and Development at the Office of Regional Conference Ministries in Huntsville, Alabama. He and his dear wife, Susan Baker, have three sons, six grandchildren, and we were all, Linda and I have often remarked, isn't it amazing? They love the Lord so much they gave all their children Bible names. <laughs> David, Benjamin, and Jonathan. But Linda and I felt privileged when they paid us the greatest compliment parents can pay their friends by allowing us to babysit their boys. 
you know you trust somebody when you leave your children with them. But we love them, love them a long time. And as you know, my church family knows, very rarely do you see your pastor sit to listen to someone else preach. When that happens, you know, that's a good friend. And as we were sitting there, he leaned over to me and said, are you going to sing? I said, yes, I'm going to sing. And I want to do a song that I think, I hope and pray it will be a ministry to you. But I want to present it to Delbert and Susan as a God-affirming word to their lives and ministry. And that is, no matter what has happened in your life and in your ministry, God has always had you in the palm of his hand. He's always been watching over you. Through the ups and the downs, he's been there for you. Listen to the message in this song. Why should I feel discouraged? Why should the shadows come? Why should my heart feel lonely and long for heaven and home? When Jesus is my portion, my constant friend is he, his eyes on the sparrow, and I know he's watching over me. His eyes on the sparrow And I know he's watching over me I sing because I'm happy Oh Lord, I sing because I'm free for his eye is on the sparrow and I know he's watching over me his eyes on the sparrow and I know he's watching over me I know he's watching over me I know he's watching over me I sing because I'm happy Oh Lord, I sing because I'm free for his eye is on the sparrow and I know he's watching over me. I know 
He's watching over me. Yes, yes, yes. I know He's watching over me. I feel so much love in this place this morning. Uh, from the very beginning when we went to the study and the head elder prayed for us and they gave us all the instruction, we walked out, the praise team uh, was singing, and I have come, my wife and I have come to appreciate them. We see it, as she said, from a distance. And, and Wade, you, you're holding well, brother. He's holding the line. And then the music, the wonderful music, uh, the honoring of my dear wife of years. <laughs> 48 years, 48 years. Uh, I'm, I'm okay with that. I'm okay with that, and I'm, I'm okay with my, my age as well. Uh, I, I told my wife, I almost, I said, I'm going to tell my age this morning. Uh, but I decided I wouldn't, you know. So it <laughs> kind of works better that way that we... Keep it separate there. And the kind statements, uh, the lovely comments from my sister, uh, Pastor Phipps, I now know why what we, Susan and I told you and Linda this morning, I know the secret. We said we went five years uh, to the continent of Africa in Nairobi, Kenya at the Adventist University of Africa. It's a general conference institution, graduate school, only masters, PhDs, and DMINs for the three African divisions on that continent. And those of you who have not been to another country, uh, to imagine that we would do this in our 60s was a significant decision. And I, you said it well, it was a big decision. Uh, we, we really struggled with that. But I remember when they asked us would we serve another term, and we said no, <laughs> it was five years, but we agreed to that. Uh, and several times there were offers that came up, but my wife and I were of the conviction we promised to give God five years on the continent and to do something we had never done but always wanted to do in our years of ministry, and that's to serve overseas. I went to school in Jamaica. I'm from California. went to school in Jamaica, though, for a year, but never served ministry there. So we wanted to give five years, but that was it. When we came back, I will never forget, when we landed in the United States, it was like one of those moments, you know, it was, it was COVID was here, uh, we went to that, through that whole period there on campus, and, and we got through, but we landed in the United States and we said, we made it. No harm, no danger, no problems. And that's my testimony this morning, I praise God, I really do. It, it was an incredible, incredible blessing. And Whitley, now I understand when you told me this morning that you were praying for us. I never knew that. I never, never knew that uh, Palm Bay was praying for us there some 7,000 miles away in another land. But now I see that your prayers and the prayers of many godly people uh, were holding us up in ways that we didn't even know. Remember to pray for those overseas workers and those what they call international or inter-service workers now. Uh, the, it's, it's a blessing. You used to call them missionaries, but, but pray for them. People who are there in other lands, it's different when you go to another country and you're not a citizen there, you don't talk the way people talk, and yet you're there ministering. So, so I, I do want to share some friends too with you. I got to introduce our, my dear friends to you, and I'll say it right here. Uh, Jeff and Clara White, we we went to school together in academy and then college um, at Oakwood. And then he went to Loma Linda for his medical degree as a doctor. Susan went in physical therapy. 
Uh, Clara got her degrees in her various, uh, in business and in technology. But when we were in Africa, Jeff and Clara, they came to visit us. And it was, you, you guys will never know what it meant to Susan and me. You really won't. Uh, they came to visit us, and they spent some time with us in our home, stayed with us, stayed with us. <clears throat> and it was a great encouragement to us. You, you'll never know what it meant to Susan uh, and myself to have you come and spend those days with us. They traveled around. Uh, they gave us a wonderful gift. In fact, they gave us several gifts when we were there. They helped to build the work up there uh, in Nairobi, the uh, Adventist University of Africa. So thanks. Dr. Jeff, Sister Clara, won't you stand and wave, please? Just wave at them, if you would. They came down to spend this weekend with us, uh, with the Phipps, and with their friends and our friends, the Lewises, uh, Dr. Tony Anthony uh, Lewis and his wife, Jamie, I believe. Uh, I, would you please stand? I, you, you know everybody here. Just wave at them, if you would, please. That, that's good. That's good. You know them as well. Uh, we heard online the wonderful story, uh, Pastor Phipps, about your miraculous... A discovery of your heart situation uh, that needed attention. We saw it, we watched it with rapt attention online, and it was really a blessing to us. And the way God providentially worked all that out with yourself and Billingies and so forth, uh, praise God for, uh, for that story as well. So, uh, folks, it's a blessing to be here with you this morning. Uh, as my wife mentioned, we watch you on a regular basis from a distance. Uh, we are not physical members here, but we love uh, Pastor Phipps and Linda, as he said, for years and years and years. And I, I don't know who is most blessed. Now, I was, we watched the 20th anniversary, that lovely service you had. Uh, we were very moved, but the comments and the statements were made by the church, uh, the elders and the deacons and the deaconesses for the pastor and Mrs. Phipps. And then I heard your comments. And then I heard something unusual. I heard Linda speak. And, and I seldom have heard her speak, but she spoke and spoke very well and about how much they loved you and about how you made their ministry possible. So you can't have ministry unless it's reciprocal. It's got to be both ways. And he loves you, but you love him back. And his, your incredible uh, ministry, uh, Pastor Phipps Swintley, to the world not simply to the Seventh Adventist Church and to the North American Division and to the Southern Union and to Southeastern Conference and to this church, uh, but you have a global ministry with the U.S. Dream Academy, which I was with you at the beginning, you recall when I was at Oakwood, and then your international singing ministry and your creative, innovative projects. Uh, we, we talk on a regular basis. We, we meet at least monthly in we brainstorm with a small group of professionals and Christian leaders, and we have a chance to share back and forth. And some of the things that Pastor Phipps is working on are, are just some incredible things, uh, video and technology and with reading, with expanding the knowledge. Uh, I think you'll see greater things in the future that you may not know about uh, right now. Uh, but that's only possible, his ministry and the Dream Academy, because you have unselfishly allowed him to serve the world. That's wonderful, folks. And I just want to personally affirm you and to personally affirm you, uh, Pastor Phipps, for the love that this congregation has one toward the other. 20 plus years is kind of hard to imagine that. I've never been in place 20 years, uh, but you've done this and, and God has blessed you in an incredible way. May he bless you with many, many more uh, years. So I tell you, there's so much love, I don't know what to do. But I think what I should do is preach the word of God uh, with you this morning. And I have a message for you. I have a message for you. Because I, I know and believe that the church is a place for the proclamation of the gospel. Uh, what Jesus has done on Calvary that is efficacious more than 2,000 years down the line that says, when I accept Christ as my personal savior, when I say, Jesus, I recognize the fact that I am a sinner, I have fallen short of the glory of God, I accept you as my Lord and savior, he then takes possession of my life. 
And everything I deal with from that point, all I have to deal with, in and out, ups and downs, as we mentioned, I know that it all works together as the lovely song we just heard. My times are in his hands. That's what you know when you accept Christ, and that's what you hear about in the church. Every week you come and you're reinforced with that idea that, that you're not by yourself, that you, you have a friend and you have a, a partner, someone who's with you to help you with whatever problem you face. That's what you do in church. It reminds you of that. And those of you who are visiting who don't know Christ, we invite you to come into Christ so you could share the same wonderful blessings. But there's more than that. They got problems. We are human beings. We are sinful. We make mistakes. We blow things. We, we, we stumble over ourselves. We argue with each other. We get in fights. We, we commit sins in spite of the love of God. But yet the gospel is so great and so encompassing and so powerful, it says that even when you sin, Jesus still loves you. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. He still loves you. But when you're off by yourself and you're off in a corner and you're not with the people of God, you forget that. And the devil takes that from your mind and he allows you to feel that you're by yourself and, and you're so evil and so wicked that God doesn't love you and he's got nothing to do with you. Church reminds you that he does love you. And he wants you to confess your sins and, and ask for forgiveness and repent, and he accepts you back. That's what church does. But church does something else, and that's what I want to focus on for the next few minutes this morning. And that is it tells you how to deal with the mess of life. And I tell you, we got some mess, folks. I mean, when you see the United States of America and you see the, the tensions we have racially, uh, fighting one race with the other, one group with the other, you see politically, we've never seen it so bad in Congress, just fighting one another, crazy stuff. We see congressional leaders and uh, judges and other people being accused and things going on. It kind of blows your mind and you say, what's happening here? We see the violence, I, I just ran across this, uh, from the violence archives, I just ran across it the other day, it says that we have now reached the unenviable position of we now have more mass killings in 2023 than we have days in the year. So we have 111 days in the year, and we have 163 mass killings. I mean, that's mind-boggling. How are we going to deal with that stuff? I hate to say it, but I'm happy to say it. But when I came in, one of the things the church told us, they said, well, we have security here, so we want you to see that this church is secure. And, and I saw the brothers, I said, yeah, I'm, I'm secure. <laughs> we're, we're secure. But, but that's what we're dealing with now. That's what we have to deal with. That's the world we're living in. How do you cope with your situations? It was in 1942. November 28, at the Coconut Grove Club in Boston, Massachusetts. About 1045, a fire broke out in this bar, and the people there were immediately just overwhelmed with fright, and they all rushed toward the door, seeking to get out, and as a result of that, they blocked the door, and they were not able to escape. And literally... The record shows us that some 492 people were killed. It was a terrible incident, terrible incident. But to me, it prefigures the times that we're living in. Things are happening, churches, and recently in Nashville, I know that place, and I know that school, and, and other places in malls, and we, we see these horrendous things happening, and we say, what should I do? It's like we're concussed, TBA, the traumatic brain injury or attack. Just, it hits us and we're rattled. We don't know. We wonder in our own families, we see horrible things happening in our families and in our churches and in our schools. And we say, what will I do? How will I deal with that? The church can help you. 
pastor spoke on depression not long ago. And you come here to hear, to get tools on how you deal with these issues of life. And it all comes from the word of God. Amen? For the word of God? The powerful word of God, the inerrant, uh, the reliable, the sharp word of God that says to us that when we open this book and we read these words and we believe them, we are empowered to face whatever life has for us. That's what the Bible does. That's what the Bible does. That's why you come to church. That's why your pastor preaches and your teachers teach and your leaders lead. Because you want to know how to deal with the issues of life. Well, that incident that happened in Coconut Grove there, that terrible accident. Well, the, the people in the city of Boston were overwhelmed. The doctors couldn't handle it. Uh, they, the trauma units, uh, the patients, there were so many of them, not simply the 492 that died, but there were many others who were injured. The smoke inhalation... Uh, the accidents, the harm that happened to them, it, it was a mess. And then even after that, uh, they did studies on what happened to those people who were in that bar. And many of the people who were there, uh, they had uh, survivor's guilt, meaning that they don't know how they got out of it. And they figured they felt guilty. How did I get out? But no one else got out. And they had to deal with that. They had to deal with the trauma. How do you survive that type of mental concussion or that spiritual block? How did God let this happen? Or what's going on with our world? Why is this going on? And I have a simple story to tell you that the elder read this morning uh, for us in 1 Samuel chapter 30. And I'll give it to you rather directly, and I think you'll get it. 1 Samuel chapter 30. And the, verse, the verses you read this morning, we read this morning, and now it happened. Now remember, folks, and now it happened is whenever you read that in the Bible, that's it. So it could happen in your life too. Now it happened one day you took a certain path and you had an accident. One day you went one place and you ran into some harm that you never anticipated. Now it happened. It's, it's the events of life that problems will come and we have to be prepared for whatever comes our way. That's the first point I want to make here, that problems happen in a world of sin. So don't be surprised when it happens. Persecution will come. You will have problems. You will have to struggle with yourself. You have to deal with deep inner conflicts in your own life and in your family that you've got to work through. They will come. Now it happened. When David and his men came to Zigzag. Now, now I, I want to just be truthful with you. This passage, when you read it right off, you just think about a bad thing that happened. The truth of the matter was David was being bad at the time this chapter happened. He was in Philistine territory. He shouldn't have been there. Remember Saul was tra following him around and he was tracking him down. David was supposed to be king and it didn't think like it was happening. He was like, Lord, when are you going to make this happen in my life? I'm waiting for it. I'm looking for that promise you gave me. I don't see it. And so then he became nervous when, when Saul was trying to kill him. And so he said he would slip off to the Philistines. Now, he shouldn't have done that. He should have known better than that. Now, folks, we do things that we, sh we know better, don't we? Come on, now some things happen to us that it wasn't our fault, but other things happen to us is because we did wrong. I'm so glad that God doesn't leave us in. I mean, what happened if he did bad? Then he only helped us when we did good. He helps us when we're bad and when we're good. Came to Zigzag on the third day that the Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziglag attacked Ziglag and burned it with fire. <laughs> burned it with fire. I mean, they totally destroyed it with fire, and had take, taken captive the women and those who were with them from small to great. They didn't kill anyone, but carried them away and went their way. Now, now I'm thinking David comes upon this, this setting here. He sees, he, he went away to Etches to the Philistines. He almost went to battle with them, but remember when he was about to go, it wasn't because of what he did, they said, we don't want you to go with us, David, because we don't believe you're going to fight your own people. 
So we don't want you to go. So they sent him home to Ziklag. Now, that was providence too, because at the very time that David was going to go with the Philistines against the Israelites, the Amalekites were attacking his city. Plus, he made a tactical error. He should not have allowed all of his men to go with him and leave his city and guard it. He had attacked the Malachites himself, and so why would he assume that he was safe without leaving protection? So not only was he wrong spiritually in the wrong place, but he was wrong tactically or militarily by not being thoughtful. So he was dead wrong. If God wanted the judgment to fall upon him and leave him in the mess he was in, he could have done it. But my God loves us. Amen? And even when, like I said, when we're in our mess, he comes through for us. And then it says that it was burned with fire, and their wives and their sons and their daughters had been taken captive. Then David and the people who were with him lifted up their voices and wept. Now, folks, sometimes you got to cry. I have, in my life, run into things that have been so overwhelming to me that I have wept. Somehow or another, Adventists and Christians, and I know men, males, we don't know how to cry. We think it's unmanly to cry. Uh, Jesus, the shortest verse in the Bible says what? Jesus wept. Jesus wept. Sometimes we have to cry. And I think it's, it's catharsis, it's, it's therapeutic, it's, it's relieving for us when we face the problems in our families and in our, in our communities and in our churches that, that sensitive men and women just cry sometimes. It says, and they wept, and they wept, but their weeping caused them to think. And then it says, they wept until they had no more power. Now, that's some serious weeping. It's like when you're just heaving. You're crying so hard, you just heave. You lost a loved one. A tragedy hits. So on the way right here, I just, with the regional office that we work with in Huntsville, we, we hear about all the deaths in all the regional conferences there at the office there in Huntsville. My wife and I, we live in Maryland, but we, I commute down at least every month, at least a week in there and work from home otherwise. But we get all the text messages about all the deaths and problems. And, and there's some shocking things. We see so many people dying and that you, you just, the COVID is hitting hard and, and the violence and there's illnesses that come up. And you just feel the pain. So they wept until they could weep no more. And get this, in verse 5 it says, And David's two wives, Ahinoam and the Jezreelite and Abigail, they were taken too. Now, I want, to, I want you to think about something. Now, here, here's something that is, is hard for, for us to deal with sometimes as Christians. We have a tendency when a calamity happens, we only think about the bad that happened. Okay, we, and, and rightly so, we understand it. There was an accident, and so somebody was harmed or whatever. There was some calamity that happened, and some lives were taken. But I think it's pretty instructive in this Bible passage when it says here, it says that he went there to the city and all the people were taken and he comes there and there was no body there. Now that's bad. And they wept. But there's something good about that. There were no bodies there. Meaning that they took the wives and all the inhabitants, but nobody died. There was, nobody, there was no death there. So there is some good in every situation that if you look at it long enough, you'll say, yeah, the Lord allowed this, but I thank God he didn't do this. And, and so there's this balancing out of it. There were no life. Now, if they had killed the people, if they had killed the kids, there would have been all the dead bodies everywhere, but there was no one around. So that was something in itself. And see, you see what happened after that? It says, it says, but David, but the people got together for the people spoke. It says, now David was greatly distressed beside losing his wives and the people in the town. It says he was greatly distressed in verse 6 for the people spoke of what? That's the price of leadership. Leaders often are blamed for things that sometimes are their fault, sometimes aren't their fault. So they turned to him and they said, why did you leave us in this situation? Why did you take everybody here? Why did you leave somebody here to protect the city? And on and on and on they began to reason. And they were upset with David and all of his 600 men with him were mad. How did you leave us here? Why did we go to the Philistines in the first place? And now we're back here in this mess on hand. What are we going to do? 
And at that point, my brothers and sisters, is, is the first lesson I give you today on what you do to survive a spiritual crisis. The first thing you do is you think. You assess the situation. How bad is it really? Is there any alternative? What, what should I do? You know, you have to kind of assess yourself. The Bible says a couple of times in, in 1 Corinthians, and in, in, it says, examine yourself to see if you're in the faith. Check yourself out. Now, according to what the Bible implies here, and what Ellen White says in uh, Patriarchs, and, uh, yeah, Patriarchs and Prophets, she says that David immediately recognized that God had allowed this because he had dropped his guard. And he began to introspect, look at his life, and say, Lord, what have I done? How have I made this mistake? What should I do? Every crisis should cause us to assess ourselves. Amen? I mean, just think about it. Pray about it. Ask God, why did you allow this to happen? What's going on here? What are you telling me in this situation here? Why, why am I being overwhelmed with this? And where is my faith in this situation? And so David begins to ask himself the question, and he goes down in prayer. And I believe in his prayer, he asks God, will you forgive me, Lord? I made a mess of things. I didn't trust you when I should have trusted you. And now I see, forgive me, I claim your righteousness. And at some moment, like all of us, the peace of God comes over David. And he is assured that though you made mistakes, David, and you're paying for it right now, and the people under your charge are paying for it, I have forgiven you, and I will be with you. And he gives him this assurance, and somehow or another, David encur it says David encouraged himself, or he strengthened himself. He built himself up. Do you have that ability? Can you assess the situation, and you're in a mess? You've got some physical challenge. You don't know what to do. The doctors are giving you doom and gloom. What do you do when you assess the situation? Can you encourage yourself at that time and say, God is with me? I don't see a way. I, I don't see how to get out of this situation. I don't have the answer, but I know God is with me. I know what his word says. I, I heard that song in church. I heard the praise team. I heard the Sabbath school lesson. And I'm sure that God is with me in spite of who I am. It's power net, my sisters and brothers. Help yourself. Sometimes you just got to help yourself, right? I mean, they may, somebody else may not pat you on the back. Sometimes you got to pat your own self on the back and just say, I know the Lord's with me. I don't feel right and I don't look right and I'm not in a good situation, but I know the Lord is with me. I know he's my redeemer and he's blessed others and he'll bless me. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. You got to encourage yourself. Yeah, check it out and just see, think. Stop. You got to stop crying at some point. Now, you know, I said you got to cry. Nothing wrong with crying, but you don't keep on crying. You got to wake yourself up and say, okay, now let's just kind of pull this thing under control. <clears throat> I do this sometimes with my family. You know, I got a family. You know, families have drama. Don't, does, does your family have some drama? I, I know mine does. I admit it. My family has some drama. I got three hard-headed adult sons, and they got, they got six kids, and so we got six grandkids, and you got me. <laughs> I mean, not my wife, me, I'm saying. You know, just. So you got trauma. But you, you got to stop and pull back and say, okay, now what can I do to approach this situation here? Let, let me use some godly principles. I heard the pastor preaching about it last. I'm dealing with depression myself. Can I use some of that in checking some of my own depression? Or is it only a message for somebody else? So the first thing you assess yourself. The second thing is you ask for help. Ask God. Well, what did he do next? Then David said to the priest, Abiathar, a Hellenic son, please, please, he was gracious, please bring the ephod to me. And Abathar brought the ephod to David. So David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue this troop? This troop? Shall I overtake them? 
Now, see, after you do the assessment of the problem, when the calamity or tragedy happens to you, that concussion that knocks you off your feet, you cry, you feel bad about it, you check yourself out, you go to God and you get it right with him. That's the assessment part. Then you come and you say, Lord, what should I do? How do I get out of this mess that I'm in? And, and I don't know about you, I journal. I journal on a regular basis. Every day I take notes. And in my journal, I do a lot of going through my thoughts and getting things clear in my mind. You don't have to do that. But you do have to say, Lord, what should I do? How do I get out of this situation here? Now, I, you, know, I, you know, I'm from the education background, so I'm very much about methodologies and techniques and styles. But, you know, you, you can forget the essence of what I'm saying, but if you just remember the principle of it, I got a problem. I do go to Jesus. <laughs> okay, <laughs> it's, it's simple as that. I mean, we, we can make it technical and say I'll do an evaluation or I figure out my methodologies. But really, what it is is, Lord, I made a mess of things. I'm sorry. Now I got to get out of this mess. What should I do? What should I do? So, the priest told him, "Go ahead." I, I often talk with Pastor Phipps and. You know, he, he'll, he'll say often, well, the Lord said to me, <laughs> you know, you know he, the, the way the Lord speaks to him. Now, now, the way he speaks to Pastor Phipps may not be the way he speaks to you. You, you, you may hear a voice. You might. Or, or you may just feel a strong impression. He says, that's what I should do. When you pray and you ask God to do something, you rise from your knees and you're looking for the answer. Because you know if you come to God in faith, he will not turn you away. If you come in faith, you please him. And everyone who pleases him, he gives you answers. And so he'll tell you what you need to do. Now I'm telling you folks, that, that is a tried and proven way in scripture. And every time you come to church, it's going to be reinforced home to you. You, you see where you are, you examine yourself, what is my contribution, and then you say, okay, Lord, I'm sorry for what I've done. Your righteousness will cover me. I have salvation in Christ. And then you say, what should I do? And he will help you like he helped David. Okay. So, so David does it. And by the way, when you ask for help, the second step, you know, you ask for help. First you assess yourself and you ask for help. Now, the Bible says he went to Abiathar, the high priest, and so that's talking about spiritual help. But sometimes you need to get your brothers and sisters to help you. There may be somebody in this congregation who can help you with your problem if you just be humble enough to ask for help. It could be some professional. It could be some non-professional. It could be some sister or brother around. You say, listen, I, I'm in need of prayer today. I need, I need some prayer. That is showing your humility and you're asking God to come in and then they can help you. So after David prayed, he got the assurance from God to go forward. Then he goes to the 600 men who were ready to stone him before. He goes to them and he says, God has spoken to me. <laughs> God says we should go forward. Now they're saying, okay, we have just come 50 miles from being with the Philistines. And where you're going, Besor, the brook Besor they were going to is another 15, 20 miles, those men are tired and weary and worn, but somehow know that the enthusiasm of David and the fact that he believed God and he was convicted that God was with him, it caused them to say, okay, we'll go. And so they go. And the third item is you assess your situation, you ask for help, and finally, you act in faith. You do something. Now, some of us keep, you know, we have a problem. We ask God for answers. He gives us an answer. We just keep on praying and praying and studying the spirit of prophecy and coming to prayer meeting, the same, the same testimony week after week after week, and we're not doing nothing. We haven't changed any lifestyles. You've got a health situation. Uh, God has impressed you. Yes, he'll bless you health-wise, but you've got to change some of your health habits to complement what you want God to do for you. Doctors, can you say Amen. You, got, you, get a part, you play a part in this. So you've got to act. He had to get these men up, the 600 men up. They had to go to the south, not from the north where he's coming from. Go south in Israel, and they were going after the Amalekites. 
He didn't know what to find. He didn't know what state they would be in. He just knew that God had impressed him to go, and so he went with these 600 men. And remember the story? They're going to the, the, the brook Besor, and uh, he saw that 200 of the men were just weary. They couldn't go on. He was so convinced of what God would do for him. He said, I don't need all the money I can get. Just give me the money I, can, I have in my hand here that's available. God's going to be with us figuratively speaking. So he says, look, you 200 stay here at the brook and we'll take 400 and we're going to find them. And you know the wonderful end of the story, right? They go out and they find these Amalekites and they're righteous. They're just, they figured the whole thing, they had stopped the plan of God. They had won the victory and, and they had all the spoils were there and David was victorious at getting all the women, the children, everyone back, and all the spoils, plus some. My God will fulfill all of your needs. Can somebody say amen today? All of your needs, not some of them. He will bless you more than you could ever imagine or think God will be with you. You assess your situation. You ask God for help. You act in faith, and God will give you the victory. But let me tell you one Final thing. This is, I had three points, but I got a fourth one, and then I'm closing. How did that help come? There is some research out or literature out that says that there are things that don't seem to make sense but are very powerful. In fact, it brings out that if you are having a problem, sometimes one of the best things you can do is to help somebody else. In the midst of your problem. You're saying, how can I help somebody when I got problems myself? By helping other people, God can give you answers to your problems. You think by getting and getting and getting, that's the answer. No, you get and you give, and then God gets, pours it over you, overflows you with blessings. That's how he gives it back to you. You know how it was there, and they crossed the brook. They're still looking for the Amalekites, and they see, they said, and there was an Egyptian. Now, he was way out of his way. These were Jews, these were Amalekites, the Philistines. There's an Egyptian. David sees this Egyptian in a desert, and I've been to the Negev Desert. I've gone through there at night and day. It's a barren, dry, it's a man out there by himself. He's got no food. He's got no clothing. He's got no water. They see this man, and David, who's going after the Amalekite, stops, brings the Egyptian in, and says, let me give you some food and water. He had no clue. He says, who are you? That's in the same chapter. Read it when you go home. He says, who are you? And the Egyptian says, well, I just... I'm a slave. I'm a slave, and I think that's nobody. Why do I want to spend time with a slave? No, no, listen, David. Be nice, David. You don't know where the blessing's coming from. You don't know where it's coming from. David brings him in. He gives him some, some raisin cakes, some water, refreshes him. And he says, who are you? He says, well, I'm a slave of the Amalekites. Amalekites? Oh, Amalekites. That's who we're looking for. So he says to him, he says, um, can you tell me where they are? <laughs> I happen to be looking for them. Can you tell me where they are? He's okay, I'll, I'll tell you. He's negotiating now. There's nothing wrong with negotiation. I, I like negotiations. He says, if you swear to me, you will not kill me and you will not turn me over to the master who left me to perish in the desert because he thought I was no good to him. If you will do that, I will take you there. And that was his answer. So by helping others, David was helping himself. Wow. That, that's, that's what they call counterintuitive. It apparently doesn't make sense, but it is. By helping others, you are helping yourself. And David has this wonderful victory, and even after that, you know, they had some wonderful stuff. Read that whole chapter, study when you get a chance. He takes all the spoils. Remember, he gets the spoils. He gets this wonderful victory. A lot of times, people get an answer to the prayers, and they get all selfish and uppity and proud and arrogant. They want to keep the blessings all to themselves, you know, I mean. But, but, but David wasn't like that. David wasn't like that. He took the, he took the gifts, all the spoils back. And so he, they meet these 200 men at the brook and they say, Hey, you know, they say, how was it? Did you, you're victorious. You have all these flocks coming back. We're victorious. 
And 400 of the men, or these a group among the 400, said to them, no, no, you don't get anything. All you're getting is your, is your wives back and the things you lost. You're not getting any spoils because you didn't go to battle. Oh, no, David said, no, no, you're not doing that, folks. He said, God has blessed me, and you, they're gonna, everybody's going to get part of the blessings. I'm going to spread it around. And David established to that day, he says, whenever we go to battle, the spoils are shared with all, not simply the ones who are up in front. So that means when Pastor Phipps is up here preaching and singing and, and the musicians are playing, the people, the ushers and the security guards and the people outside and the people giving the children's story, they get credit too. It's all a part of the same thing, praising God. Some have the positions up in front, some don't have the positions, but everybody gets the spoils. And David shared it with everybody and he shared it with all the other uh, other cities around who are affected by, by the Amalekites as well. And the Bible says that he spread the goods. My brothers and sisters, do you love Jesus? Do you love him enough to trust him? Next time or now when you're facing a problem, assess the situation. Think what your role is and make things right with God if you need to. And then you go to him and you go to him in prayer if you can play for me right now, that'd be great. Go to him in prayer and ask, ask him to, to make it right and to show you what his will is, and he will answer you. He may do it through a friend. He may do it through a voice. He may do it through an impression, but he'll do it. But, but don't doubt. Don't waver. Be strong in your faith and look for the answer. And then after that, move forward in faith. And when you're doing it, anybody who's around you that you see someone who needs some help, you help that person. And you will see some incredible stuff happen. You will see God do some things for you that you never thought were possible. Because my Bible tells me that he always comes through for the oppressed. And those who are under crisis or problems or whatever it is. How does it say he blessed Daniel in the lion's den? Peter in prison, Jonah in the belly of a well, David under Goliath's sword. The disciples, when they were in the storm and they thought they were going down, healing for the lepers, security and assurance for doubting Thomas. Lazarus was three days in the grave and he raised him to life. My God is a mighty God. Paul was in prison so many times, shipwrecked. He says, I was down, but God turned my condition. I love that song, the Corinthian song. You know that Corinthian song? I am oppressed. I am overwhelmed. And God comes through for me all the time. He changes the situation around for me. The very thing that I thought was pulling me down, God turns it around for his glory. I praise God. I hope that in your experience, you will trust God. You will try him. You will put him on the line. And you'll come back here, prayer meeting and church time, and to your friends and say, look what God did for me. I was down and out, and I, I had no hope. Everything was dark and gloomy, and I, I didn't know where to turn, but I, I, I looked at my situation, and I, I took responsibility for where I had done wrong. I turned to God, and I asked him for help, and then I moved forward in faith, and he turned it around for me, and I helped somebody along the way. Let's stand together, please. Stand together. If you want to say, Lord, I want to recommit this morning. I want to make this little pack with you that I want to use your Bible principles in dealing with problems, whatever the problems that come to me. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you this morning. We, we are just simply sinners looking for light. We, we are in a context of darkness. So often our homes, our jobs, and where we are, we don't know where to turn. But we know that you are with us. And we are so encouraged with that. So this morning we claim assurance in Christ that your righteousness will cover us no matter what. We simply confess and we repent and say, Lord, I give my life to you. Now please give us answers to our challenges, to our problems. 
and give us the power, the energy to move forward in faith. And by the way, when we're doing so, just like you're helping us, we want to help somebody else in need. We do, Lord. If we see them, you bring them to our attention. Those who are without food or without water, who are in prison, who are in the nursing homes, those who are discouraged, I will give to them out of my fullness. I will give to them. And even as I do, I know you'll bless me back. In the name of Jesus Christ, we all say together with one voice, amen and amen. Hallelujah. Can you say hallelujah? Praise God. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Come 